it's my pleasure to be here today simply to introduce Sir Mike Rake. But before doing that, I would, I'm sure on behalf of many, but certainly on my part, thank Lachlan and Charles and all those who've been involved in taking forward this blueprint for better business over the last year in particular. I think it's been a remarkable journey and this is a very important moment in its development. Earlier this year, and following the conference we had last year, Mike asked me to be with him at a dinner of chairs of some of the major UK companies. The idea of that dinner was to explore whether this blueprint offered a way to bring together organizations who were both hesitant, defensive about the deficiencies of the recent past, and yet wanting to explore and contribute to a more positive future. It was a fascinating evening. I sat there much of the time thinking about the very close parallels with the Catholic Church. And at one point, one of the chairmen said, what we need is something of the leadership being shown by Pope Francis. He said, we need to get out there and wash a few feet. Now, gestures are fine and symbols are powerful, but they need to be connected to a deeper sense of purpose, which I know, I'm sure many of you sense, that Pope Francis is generating within the Catholic Church. So it therefore gives me, with that background, great pleasure to introduce Sir Mike, who, as you know, is chairman of the CBI and of British Telecom. And he's a strong supporter of the ethos behind the blueprint for a better business. Recently, as you know, the CBI has launched a task force looking at restoring trust in business. And Mike asked me if I would be an independent challenger to that task force. He is passionate about business, but also about the need for frankness and honesty in naming and addressing business failures. So there's probably no one better placed to give us this overview of why purpose matters. And you, I, like you, I'm looking forward very much to hearing what he has to say. So Mike Rake. Um, Archbishop, thank you very much indeed. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, if we come straight to this question of purpose, and you were to ask people out there today, a lot of people, what is the real purpose of business? They would tell you, basically, it's about short-term profit. It's about the reward of the few, the cost of the many. It's about trying to take advantage of every single situation that exists, whether it was the absence of regulation and regulators in the banking sector, whether it's the ability to pay no tax in any country you operate in, whether you do these things whilst ignoring the environment you're in, whether you do this without any care or consideration for the impact on families who've suffered, people who become unemployed, whether indeed you care about the society you live and work in. And I think many people would feel that that maybe was the way they see the purpose of business. And I'll come back to that. Because regardless of the fact that when people talk about purpose and vision and values, this can be met with a barrage of cynicism if you're not careful. And that's, it's so important to make sure that it does become real. And I think purpose, although it can be criticized and people can look at it in a cynical way, really has to be thought about in every single organization. And why is it important? Actually, it is what brings together uh, uh, you know, a view a roadmap towards long-term sustainable profit. And that is key for society. It is about actually engaging your employees and what that purpose really is. It's about engaging and working with and not abusing your supply chains and allowing you to deliver on those longer-term amb uh, ambitions. It is therefore about delivering for society. And it is by doing that gaining political acceptability. And if we gain political acceptability and are able to do the right thing for society, we will inevitably do the right thing for shareholders. 
And of course, at the end of the day, shareholders are not just individuals. They are things that pay our pensions, fund our infrastructure, and create employment, and are absolutely critical. So we asked at the CBI some time ago, 15 months ago, the question, is business good for society? And there are 25 million people in this country working in the private sector, at least, actually probably a few more now. Only 53% of the population believes that business is good for society. Only 32% believe that business is ethical. And unsurprisingly, 68% believe that industry scandals have impacted and destroyed trust in business and in business leaders, particularly large businesses and large business leaders. Indeed, you will have read, it's not just the CBI, it's not just the work comments, all the surveys that we've seen, the World Economic Forum have shown that in the last six years of downturn and recession, the worst since the 30s, trust has been lost in many institutions. In political institutions, business, in some cases the church, regulators, the media, virtually all. And the bigger those organizations and institutions are, the less trust is placed in them. And that's something that's pretty critical because this leads inevitably to some unattractive movements and discussions and people who emerge where we see some unpleasant xenophobia, unpleasant nationalism, a move towards anti-foreigner, anti-immigration, more based on emotion and frustration than fact. And that's an unfortunate position to be in as a country or indeed in many parts of the world where the same issues are applying, where people tend to become protectionist, tend to become tribal, tend to become xenophobic. Because these things that I've discussed apply, the World Economic Forum shows, right the way across the world in most countries. So that's why, as the Cardinal referred to, the, the, the CBI decided that we needed to have a great business debate. We needed really to engage in this issue. And that's why I and we are so supportive of Lachlan and Charles and the Archbishop in terms of this blueprint for better business because they think they, we come, they, come, they come together extremely well and can make a real difference over time and it will take time. This isn't something you can snap your fingers, make a statement, sign a pledge and think you've regained the trust of people. You haven't. This is going to take years. To do this, we believe that it's very important that we do two things. That we recognize what we do that is good for society, and also what we need to do to reestablish trust by our actions, which always need to speak louder than our words. And that's critically important if business is to be heard in the areas where it should be heard, where it can introduce facts about the economy, about jobs, about issues that the country faces, that should be a part of the political debate rather than allow the political debate, as is very often the case today, to run on emotion rather than on fact. Now that's understandable in the environment we're in, and this may apply to many areas of activity, whether it's about what is necessary to create well-paid jobs, what is good or bad about the European Union, what's good or bad about immigration, and many other issues. So first of all, some of the things we need to remember as well is what we do do, what business does do for society. 30% of all taxes raised come from business, 180 billion a year. During this great downturn, 1.3 million jobs have been created in the last three years by business, replacing many jobs lost out of the state sector. Not always very well paid jobs, which I'll come back to, which is a critical point. We do have actually some of the lowest prices for utilities in Europe. We have some of the lowest prices in broadband, some of the best coverage. We contribute 600 million a year in cash to UK charities and communities. So none of these things are necessarily seen or understood right now, but they are facts, regardless of the perceptions. But there are several issues that we really have to understand in business as we move forward. It is absolutely critical that this recovery in this country is for everyone. So far, yes, we've got economic growth, but most of the jobs that have been created have been created in low-pay conditions, 
people are not seeing an improvement in their standard of living. They're feeling better about the security of their jobs. And we in business also know that this recovery is fragile. You know, there are many issues out there that are geopolitical around the Middle East, around Ukraine, around recovery in the Eurozone that are economic, many things that are outside our control in this, in this country. But there are many things that are critically important that we do to make sure that the recovery we have is sustainable, does benefit everyone, and particularly the lowest paid in society, whilst recognizing that we have to get our deficit down and support the government in that sense. And that's again why the voice of business, who are the people who have to do this, has to be trusted. Has to be trusted so people will want politicians to listen to business when it speaks the truth and it speaks about issues that make a difference to their lives and their economy. So it is critical that, for example, we really get across that we believe in long-term sustainable growth in earnings. Why wouldn't we? Business wants the same as the unions. We want well-paid consumers who want to buy our goods. We want consumers who feel confident about their role in society and around their security for the future. Why wouldn't we want that? That's what we're in business for. And sometimes I think we forget that as to where the customer really is. To do that and to make sure that we can start to deliver something that works for everyone, there has to be a big improvement in productivity. And we have to use technology and investment from business to do this, to create jobs and to be able to create the levels of productivity where we can pay people better because this will make a big difference. And this is something where business is engaged. The CBI has put together a manifesto for all parties of things we think that will make a big difference to the employment and pay and conditions of people in this country. And we hope that perhaps they'll listen to some of these points as opposed to some of the more populist sentiments that sometimes dictate uh, politics. The other thing that we need to do is to understand that we have to really treat people fairly. You know, whether it's our customers, they have to be treated fairly. We have to think of them. Customers have to feel that if they want to change supply, they can, without attempts made to stop it. They need to feel that we're properly transparent about our pricing and utilities and how we get there. Because as we've seen, although we have low prices, that's not, the, that's not what the public think. They think they're being badly treated. There's not enough transparency. We need to understand these things and really listen and understand what the public expect from us so they trust us. Of course, you see scandal after scandal. You know, who can you now trust? The banks? No. The utilities? No. Now the retailers, apparently, no. They've been taking advantage of us too. So there's a huge issue here about transparency and about responsibility. And again, we come back to some of the issues that companies have to stand back and look at and take a longer term view about their purpose and what they're trying to do. That, for example, would come down to taxation. You know, the, we live in a world where many governments, many organizations are trying to attract businesses to come in to lower tax rates. Companies have to stand back from that and understand that companies together with individuals need to be able to pay their fair share of tax to feel that they have a proper input to government that those taxes are spent fairly for the benefit of the population. But it doesn't work if businesses are broadly seen to be doing everything they can to exploit every loophole to reduce their taxes to virtually zero in some cases. Many, by the way, do have a very increasingly sensitized approach to taxes. And most boardrooms now are beginning to talk about reputational issues on tax. It's the same exactly when we come to the environment. In our survey, 60% of chief executives themselves don't believe we're doing enough in relation to the environment. And as you all know, when you have a crisis, an economic crisis of the depth we've had for the last six years, you know, it, it is, you know, some of these agendas get lost. You know, because sometimes the priorities just change to survival rather than the long-term issue of where our environment is, what our CO2 emissions are doing, whether we have a consistent policy on energy that allows these issues to be met. And it doesn't destroy jobs, but doesn't destroy the environment either. And these are issues that, again, need to come back to the essential purpose of business. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit personally, if I could, around purpose to try and uh, you know, give some meaning to it in terms of what I think is important. And I wanted to talk a little bit about BT, the company I've been chairman of for the last six, seven years. And I, I wanted to, to me, it, it, I was thinking about this over the weekend, and I went back to the time, and maybe I don't want to dump on poor old BT, but I, I joined uh, BT in 2007. Um, and I left KPMG one afternoon, and I joined BT the next morning as chairman. And I hadn't had a time to look very closely at a relation to BT. But what I, what I found, and this is at the peak of the boom, if you remember, is what BT was actually doing, like many companies was doing, it was distributing 100% of its cash flows in dividend. It was borrowing to buy back shares at a very high price. It was borrowing to make acquisitions not all of which, as in many companies, were properly integrated. And you look at this and you wonder, is that sustainable? You know, are we actually investing anything in an infrastructure company? I exaggerate a little, but not a lot. And of course, unfortunately, it became quite apparent a few months later uh, that issues were not right within the company. That part of one of our divisions uh, was running in a way that led to significant losses being incurred and needed to a complete reevaluation of where we were. And I remember sitting, we appointed a new chief executive, changed management of that division. I remember sitting with, with Ian Livingston, and we agreed that what we had to do was completely change the direction. We realized that any event, what we had to do is turn around and say, what actually is our purpose here? You know, and we felt that when we looked at it, what was obviously critical was the role that communications was going to play and technology was going to play in making a better world. The communications is key. And we had a role to play in that because we could produce the infrastructure that could allow that to happen. So in essence, we cut the dividend by 70%. It wasn't very popular. And we started, in spite of the problem, the only really big private sector infrastructure project during the downturn, which is the rollout of fiber across the UK, which was a two and a half billion project delivered 18 months ahead of time. And now we're pursued to the next one third. And as you know, super fast broadband has become not just an, a luxury or a necessity, but a utility. And in spite of it, I know there's a lot of people frustrated that we're not even doing it fast enough. But actually, we did the fastest rollout in history anywhere of fiber to two-thirds of the country. And my point in making this is that I think by having purpose around what we, BT, were trying to do and taking a longer-term view to, uh, admittedly, easier to justify an infrastructure company, we got our employees completely motivated around this was something that was important for the country as well as something that, if we did right, would increase the profitability and the security of BT and its employees and their jobs and their pensions. And I think it really worked. It led to pride, it led to a greater efficiency, it led to an understanding of the things we needed to do in a more effective way. It got built on because we decided that the Olympics was something we ought to do that supported that sort of view and vision of what was important about communications. And I think we also really, really understood that this was critical, you know, our, our, our broadband infrastructure to all the things that we talk about in this country today. So it's about the north-south divide. It's about the dominance of London. It's about productivity. It's about education. It's about the same standard of health care available to everyone, not just those who can pay or live in a particular part of the country. All of these things are absolutely critical. And I only say that not to glorify BT, to point out where we were at the peak of the boom and where I think we've got to today, which is a much more trusted organization. We have lots of things to do, by the way, with customer service that we still have to, so please, you can <laughs> complain to me later. <laughs> we're working on it. I, I'm not saying we're there yet, but um, it, 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 to me, was a good example of how if you can take a longer-term view and you can convince your shareholders who are part of this that purpose can work for you, and opening that up, that's why we really want to recognize, you know, within this great business debate, and we really want to work with the blueprint on this within that we're going to launch a large amount of engagement and discussion. And we want to do two things, again. 
what we really want to do, and business wants us to do this as well. We've got to at least speak out a little bit some of the things we have done that are good, and there are many. But more important than that, we've also got to dispel some of the myths and put place some of the facts. But the most important thing is we have to engage, we have to listen, and we have to learn. And we have to learn how to become relevant and credible. And this means really putting the customer out there. We have to understand that however frustrated we are with politicians and sometimes our feeling of their lack of um, factual basis for their comments. I'm trying to be very careful here because you're... <laughs> um, the, 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 we have to understand they're reflecting what their constituents are telling them and feeling. That perception is reality. We have to understand that. Whether we like it or not, that's where our politicians are reflecting what people think. That's why we, if we want to be credible and listened to by the politicians and put in place those economic measures that we think would make a difference to our population and to growth and to jobs. We have to be credible. To be credible, we have to be credible with the public. To be credible with the public, we have to treat them fairly, whether they're individuals who are buying utilities and pricing, whether they're people who are pensioners, whether they're supply chains where big companies are not paying them on time. Business has to understand that all of these issues have to be addressed. And we have to together make sure that there's a kind of peer pressure to understand that we all need to do that and not just some of us. And if we do, we'll create a much more resilient society that respects business, where business is still accountable. And we don't feel it necessary as the pendulum swings to send in the judicial authorities the moment something seems to go wrong. That is a sign of a lack of trust in business as a whole. A few years ago, that's not where you'd start. Today, the starting point is there. And that's a symptom of the situation we're in, which again is a wake-up call for business because that's how society feels. And that's why, again, I think that if we can do this, engage, listen, understand the business issues, make sure we engage with the shareholder community as well, where there are many of these issues that we could discuss for a long time, then I think we can be seen as relevant to society we can be seen as a force for good in society because business, in many ways, is society. So, thank you very much. Happy to take it. Uh, so, Mike will take a few questions. Um, I must say, uh, the, the pause was really nice. Uh, uh, that pause said a thousand words. Very interesting. Um, uh, could I ask the first question? Um, in practical terms, you, you're confronted with a rather respected company, um, but which does not pay any tax uh, in, in, this, in the domain in which it's functioning. How do you persuade them when, when, when they say to you, look, tell me, sorry, Mike, um, it's legal. I mean, we're doing absolutely nothing against the law. It's entirely legal. And, you know, until that changes, yep. we're, we, we, we're not going to change. Okay, so I'm going to answer your question. But I think what's really important here is the first thing you have to understand, and I'm not going to name any of those companies, we know who they are. First of all, there are many companies operating here who've created huge numbers of jobs that are well-paid jobs, have brought technology to this country, are renting and buying properties. So the contribution of those companies is still there, and politicians should be a little bit careful before they attack them too hard because they are creating wealth and value. I think you then move on to the question of you know, is legal enough? Is it just legal in these complex areas where, to be honest, you know, frankly, a technology uh, and the way of doing business has gone ahead of the t tax codes that exist to tax them? And they would say, quite rightly, look, get yourself together. And, you know, the, you know over the top sort of environment means, you know, we're encouraged to do this in this country, in that country, we're obeying the law. You know, yes, the way we operate now is at a level completely different to in the past in terms of physical location and bookings and so on and so forth. And that also is true. However, I strongly believe at the third level, and increasingly you see this, you've got to get back. However right you feel you are, perception is reality. And there is a feeling that some companies, through various mechanisms, are simply not paying their fair share of tax. And I think that's a pity because it negates the very good things that they are actually doing in terms of many of these aspects. So I think it's trying to take an holistic overview of this. 
Now, my experience uh, is that many companies now do really sit down and consider very carefully the reputational impacts of tax policy. I mean, actually, I think in some ways this was, I'm not going to name it, but there's a famous coffee chain when the, mm. and it's a little bit unfair because actually they were making losses, <laughs> which is one of the reasons you don't pay taxes. But the, the point being that their, you know, their revenues went down significantly. Mm. The public just took exception to it. Mm -hmm. you know, so you have to pay attention to it. Um, there's a question here. Can yeah. we have a microphone to the third row? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yes. Uh, good morning. Barbara Stocking um, on the one of the trustees, so clearly absolutely in touch with the, the whole philosophy here. But I want to ask Mike a question about transparency and transparency before the exposure. What I mean by that is that um, in all my time, there's 12 years in Oxfam, there was only one occasion ever where a company let us in to look at an area, an issue where they thought there might be problems and then were prepared to have that come out in public. And that was actually with Unilever in Vietnam, and it was about pay and supply chains. But the reason I say that is because I don't see how business is going to get the trust unless we get to the point when people can say that there are things actually going wrong and that need to be looked at all the time. Now, I do understand absolutely that this is te a terrible reputational issue. You know, of course companies don't want things coming out that are sort of, in, sometimes even the, the senior leadership don't know anyway, but they may suspect that there are things that do need to be looked at. But it's a real dilemma, but the public are never going to trust business unless they think they are actually going to come out and say that things are not working and that they're asking people to look at them or they're coming out cleanly about what they are. It will never happen. And I, I just want you to comment a bit on that yeah. problem of, of reputation issue. Because yeah. it's worth mentioning that the public actually work for many of these companies. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and so they too can be tapped. Absolutely. Uh, and that's, well, that's the whole point around, you know, your people or your society or your employees are the people who talk to the politicians, are the people who decide policy that often is detrimental to the people. But anyhow, um, on, the, uh, on this issue, I mean, yes, I mean, he, the, the dilemma that we have is on the one hand, you have, as you all know, the immediacy of communication of social networks. You can't keep anything secret, actually. So that says to you, um, be, be transparent, be open, get on the front foot. And often you have seconds, we saw this with major disasters that occurred that have caused huge damage to companies where they're caught on the back foot from a communications point of view. Companies inevitably, any institution actually, because we shouldn't just talk about companies, we should talk about any major institution, including some charities, including, as we've said, regulators, churches, all sorts of organizations, you know, professional service firms, all sorts of people are involved in this area. And what people always want to do is to get the facts right first before they speak. You know, so that's the dilemma, how fast you can react. And therefore, you need to be on the front foot. You need to know what's happening or try and know what's happening. This is not always easy. But it's absolutely clear that at the end of the day, if you're not, if, you're, if what you think is you're doing is right, why wouldn't you be transparent about it? Yes. If what you're doing is you know, trying, to, trying to begin to do the right thing, why wouldn't you be transparent about it? Sometimes I have to say, the only last thing I would say is there are occasions when companies do feel that when they are trying to get across the right thing, they get completely obliterated before they've managed to get halfway through the explanation. So this is, but that's reality today, and, and we, we have to try and be much more transparent, much more. We're required on OEC guidelines to be much more down our, you know, our supply chains. We're required by the Companies Act now, which is not, I think, very broadly understood, to think more broadly about all of our stakeholders which should be the support for what we want to do for business reasons, not the requirement to do something because it's legal, which will never lead to as good an impact if we do it because we believe it's the right thing to do. Sorry, anyhow. Yeah. Hello, Mark Goida, Tomorrow's Company. First of all, huge congratulations to Blueprint. Um, having worked around issues of the importance of purpose for, for a good 20 years, I find it exhilarating to be in a room where this is so widely accepted as a central business issue. Mike, you said something I wanted to pick up and challenge you on, which was about engaging your shareholders in purpose. And for us, the next frontier, really, is this issue of investor stewardship. If we're concerned about the public and the connection between the public and business, we need to make that connection whereby the public understands that they own the businesses they are often cynical about. And we need to create the transparency and the visibility 
and the simplicity in the investment system so that the public actually start to make choices, particularly in a world of DC pensions. And it's great to see people like Seth and Nusebe are going to be on the panel later. But I'd love to hear from you whether you see this as part of the agenda you're developing today. Because to me, without getting that bit right, I think we will crash into the short-termism problem big time. Uh, absolutely. And, and obviously, you know, my, my role here in the CBI is to be very honest with you, is not to attack businesses nor to defend them, but the truth is we work in a capitalist system. Uh, the truth is that you look at it and say this is not a very good system, but most other experience says that the others are pretty much worse. So that's the system we're in. And of course the reality in businesses have to deal with this every day that in your shareholder group, you know, you have to deal with all, so in BT for example, we have one million individual shareholders, <coughs> one of the largest because of our history. So we have a huge number of small individual shareholders, quite unusual actually. Mostly you're governed by institutions. And you have to have a way to deal with the long-term aspect, because you well know better than I do, as well as I know, you have short-term shareholders, you have hedge funds, you had shorting. They will make economic arguments around the, 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 the efficiency that that can create. As a company, it comes back to me, I, I believe, it, like many things in life, it's about open and honest communication. So I actually think that where you properly engage with your shareholders in a company, properly explain your strategy, properly explain what you're trying to do and the time frame over which you're trying to do it, you can get support from your shareholders to do it. And sometimes we in business are too quick to use that as an excuse because of our pressure. Engagement around that, so if they believe your strategy, they'll stay with you. If they don't believe in your strategy, they'll go, and that's fine. If you have a strategy where you want shareholders to support you on the long term, if, however, as in many cases, you tell them a, a very highfalutin strategy and vision and you don't deliver it, they're going to come after you. So, you know, I don't want to oversimplify it, but I think a lot of this, but it, it is critical if we're going to make this work that, that, that institution shareholders, you know, and some get and some don't get this, some believe it is part of their role, some don't believe it's part of their role. As you know, the FRC has been looking at that, trying to engage with shareholder groups. How do you get this view about, you know, environmental responsibility, the short term versus the long term? Uh, you, you know, the, the, the fu fundamental issues are, are around at what point in the cycle you start to recruit people on and so on and so forth. But I think it comes down to transparency of communication and trust between, you know, particularly, we're talking public companies here, obviously, in that sense, between them uh, and their shareholders. The same thing applies to trust on SMEs and banks. There we have a, a big issue uh, because in the same way that if you're not shareholder funded, and you're bank funded and you don't have you know, the rating that you need, that, that again is a real issue where, as you well know, people feel they've been let down in the SME sector by banks. The banks will, of course, say, well, we're being forced not to lend by the regulators and the capital requirements, and if we make any bad loan, we're all going to go to prison, and therefore we can't. You know, so this is quite complex in society, and I, I think part of the benefits I see of the blueprint, part of the benefits I, I see from the CBI trying to engage with this, some of these issues we just need to get on the table and have an honest discussion. There's no truth here. There's no absolute truth. There are a number of issues that we need to address and face as we go through this transition from this completely overblown position that we had in 2000, where we're all at fault except the people who suffered most, you know, to that blow up of the whole economy. And it's not just one group, it's everyone. Politicians, regulators, banks, investors, journalists, analysts, everybody, you know. But we have to move to this transition. We've got some really complex issues we've got to work through in the next three to five years to try and get the balance right here so banks can lend to SMEs and be respected for it, so shareholders can follow a longer-term view and that we can move this whole agenda forward a bit. And I believe, you know, and, and Charles uh, and, and, and Lachlan were talking about it, most people, I, I can tell you we had a discussion at the CBI chairman's meeting last week. You know, everyone, everyone's on this page that, that I speak to. When we asked to raise, I mean, I thought they'd all, about six months ago, eight months ago, actually nine months ago, before we got, when I asked the President's committee, listen, we need, the CBI needs more money to launch this debate. We want to do this properly. We want to do some proper analysis. People gave us more money. And normally you're not wanting to pay more to your, to your trade association. I, I didn't expect that. I thought, Mike, oh, you're on cloud nine. It's nonsense. I mean, blah, blah, blah. You know, but no, there, there isn't. The, the people get this, that things have gone badly wrong, and we have to try and find a way to put them right, but on a, on a sustainable basis. So, Mike, great. Thank yeah. you very, very much for spending time and energy with us. Thank you.